call for introductions. It is now time for question period. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Well, thank you uh, very much, Speaker. And my question this morning uh, is to the Minister of Education. Would the Minister please remind this House? The clock. Stop the clock. No, no, no. That's my job. <laughs> Although I appreciate the team effort, um, I am going to. Uh, I'm going to ask that uh, the, de the decorum be where it should be. Serious question. Thank you. Go ahead. Would the minister please inform this House of the number of parents who currently have children in publicly funded Ontario elementary schools and how many of these parents last November actually completed the online survey commissioned by your ministry regarding changes to the health and physical education curriculum? Minister of Education. This has been a really interesting situation, Speaker, because the, the, yesterday we had the leader of the the interim leader and the PC education critic, the sort of official spokespeople on the issue, saying that they actually welcomed our new health and physical education curriculum. the three leadership candidates who seem to be totally in a different land. No, I think you better Order. see what people have been saying. So the member from Lambton Kent, this is one of the leadership exchanges, the member from Lambton Kent Middlesex said, I've committed to stopping the sex ed agenda in its tracks. Christine, Answer. I need you to join with me at caucus and stand up to Kathleen Wynne to stop the sex ed agenda once and for all. Thank you. That's what he said. And Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, uh, obviously uh, no answer there. Stop the talk. I, I, uh, I believe I just asked for decorum and I expect it to be maintained. Uh, excuse me, I'll t take care of this. Supplementary. Minister, there are millions of parents in Ontario and you refuse to hear from over 99% of them. Not quite a consultative process. And this House should be reminded that on October the 30th, this minister said that even these opinions of these very few parents would likely not affect the content of her plan 2015 sex minister ed curriculum. Minister, now that you have released this proposed curriculum, it is clear that thousands of parents have concerns. What are your plans for a true consultative process now that Ontario mums and dads were able to see for themselves what you have planned for their children? Thank you. Minister of Education. And now the rest of the story that you're all waiting for. The member from Whitby, Oshawa, said in reply, I've been very clear on my position on that, Monty. I stand with you. There's no question I stand in the same place that you do. Parents are the ones that should be deciding about sex ed and what their children should or shouldn't be taught. There's no question I am against what they're doing. And as we speak, I presume Patrick Brown is outside. It's troubling that all three leadership candidates for the Progressive Conservative Party are in disagreement with their current caucus leadership and want to bury a new sex ed curriculum, a new health and physical education curriculum that will protect the health and safety of our children. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, back to the Minister. In recent days, the only concession you've been willing to make to concerned parents, that is, to those parents who do not share your view of how their children should be raised, your only concession has been to point out East, that the Education order. Act gives parents the right to withdraw their child from particular lessons, in other words, Minister, a highly selective opt-out. Minister, are you prepared to extend this opt-out principle to local schools? For example, if a local school council votes to opt out of your new sex ed curriculum, would you honour this request of a school council? Minister of Education. And I assume if he was Premier, you could vote to opt out of teaching about evolution too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes. 
actually. I hope the press gallery heard what the uh, member from Help Me, Mr. Nichols, said was a vote opting out of evolution would be actually a good idea for the Ontario curriculum. Actually, I happen to disagree as somebody who has a science background. Let's talk about parents. Let's talk seriously. Because we actually think that parents should be involved in the conversation. That's why we're, we're creating materials for parents so that parents can talk to their children about it. Thank you. Final supplement. Sure, my second uh, question is to the Premier. Premier, last year you tried to dodge the record of the McGuinty era by distancing yourself from Dalton's team. These weren't your people. Nothing to do with me, you said. But in recent weeks, some of your people have found themselves in hot water. The Sudbury by-election has resulted in your Deputy Chief of Staff, Pat Cerbera, and one of your Liberal fundraisers, Gary Lawhey Jr., to have allegedly broken anti-bribery laws. The matter is now being referred to federal prosecutors and other police. Premier, can you confirm for this House that you personally hired Pat Cerbera as your Deputy Chief of Staff and that you appointed Gary Lawhey Jr. to serve as chair of the local police board. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I've answered uh, questions about the Sudbury uh, by-election system uh, situation many times. I will say again, Mr. Speaker, that yes, Pat Cerbera is uh, a member of my staff. The Police Services Board in uh, Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, makes its own decisions. Um, and the fact is that I had decided uh, by the end of November that uh, that Glenn Tebow was the person who we wanted to have as our candidate in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker. And there were subsequent conversations about uh, keeping the past candidate involved. But it's interesting, interesting Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the member for Lambton Kent doesn't want to talk about the fact that there is a, 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 a protest going on outside, Mr. Speaker, about a sex ed curriculum that is going to protect children in this province in every one of our schools, publicly funded schools in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. He doesn't want to Answer. talk about that because he knows, I think, in his heart that it is the right thing to do and we need to update that curriculum, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, again, to the Premier. I'm certain the hardworking officers of the OPP are doing their best as they continue this and all of the investigations into your office. I'm certain they'll find all the evidence they can. But with Ms. Sabera and Mr. Lawhee Jr. still working in Liberal offices and a Premier who insists she believes they did nothing wrong, how can the people of Ontario be sure that your office won't double delete any evidence? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, I have answered the questions. I've said that we are uh, we are going to cooperate with the authorities. Of course, we'll cooperate with the authorities, and I've been very clear, Mr. Speaker, all along that uh, that the decision had been made. I had decided by the end of November that Glenn Tebow was the uh, the person who we wanted to have, that I wanted to have as our candidate in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, and uh, and that the conversations that happened subsequently were about keeping the past candidate involved, Mr. Speaker. But you know, um, I heard. Uh, I heard the member for St. Catharines talking about uh, the, the Roma conference, Mr. Speaker. There are people who are here today and who are meeting in, uh, in downtown Toronto to talk about issues that I would have thought would have been very important to the member for Lambton Kent, Mr. Speaker, because the issues around investments in infrastructure, the Ontario Good Roads uh, uh, members, Mr. Yes, Speaker, they're very concerned about those investments in all of the communities around the province. That's the work that Thank we are you. focused on doing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Premier, it doesn't end. Question. Well, Premier, it doesn't end there. Orange, gas plants, deleted hard drives, the Sudbury by-election, and a prominent member of your own 2013 transition team, your former Deputy Minister of Education, has now admitted to three criminal charges. Premier, in light of the criminal conduct of your own hand-picked advisers, how would you rate the ethical deficiencies of your government compared, say, to the scandals that drove your predecessor out of office? A higher standard of ethics than we got under Dalton McGuinty, or perhaps just as bad? 
Speaker, you know, that was a pretty broad-ranging question. Let me just quote back to the member something that he said yesterday. He said it's, the prem it's not the Premier of Ontario's job, especially Kathleen Wynne, to tell parents what's age-appropriate for their children. So, Mr. Speaker, especially let me just ask the member opposite, what is it that especially disqualifies me for uh, yes. the job that I'm doing? Is it that I'm a woman? Is it that, I, is it that I'm a mother? Is it that I have a master's of education, Mr. Speaker? Is it that I was a school council chair? Is it that I was the minister of education? What is it exactly that the member opposite thinks to, that disqualifies me from doing the job that I'm doing, Mr. Speaker? What is that? I'm, uh, I'm still hoping that my request for decorum is maintained. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Questions for the Premier. On December 12th, Pat Sorbera said on tape to Andrew Olivier, and I quote, You've been asked directly by the Leader and the Premier to make a decision to allow Glenn to have the opportunity to have, you know, basically the opportunity uncontested. Is that true? Thank Mr. You. Speaker, again, I have answered these questions many, many times. I had decided by the end of November that uh, Glenn Tebow was the person that I wanted to have as our candidate yep. in Sudbury. Mr. Speaker, it was clear to me that he was going to be a strong voice for Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, and that he was the best candidate for us uh, in that uh, in that by-election. And the conversations that took place, Mr. Speaker, were about keeping the past candidate involved. Would would it have been great if the uh, the past candidate had wanted to work with us and had, wa had wanted to stay as part of the team? Absolutely. That would have been terrific. But, Mr. Speaker, the conversations that were had with the past candidate were about keeping him involved because, as you know, Mr. Speaker, there are many ways of being involved in the political life of a party beyond being a candidate, and that's what those conversations were about. Supplementary. Speaker, on December 11th, Jerry Lougheed said on tape, to Andrew Olivier, I quote, the Premier up to now has Minister always said to me she's in order. favour of a nomination race, so I want to make that really clear. She's never said to me, quote, I want to appoint him, unquote. Is that true, Speaker? Mr. Speaker, uh, I made a statement last Friday, and I talked about um, the the way candidates uh, become candidates in uh, in uh, elections, general elections or by-elections. And I said that, you know, my preference is for nomination races. I have been through a nomination race that was uh, that was a very difficult experience in the in the 90s, and I think that uh, when it's possible to have a, a local nomination race, that's a good thing yeah. to do. But in those circumstances where uh, that's not possible, that's not Going to happen, Mr. Speaker, and where a decision has been made according to the constitution of the party, as uh, as was the case in the Sudbury by-election, Mr. Speaker, then I think the honest thing to do is to make that clear that that decision's been made, that a candidate has been chosen, yeah. rather than as in uh, a situation like in, in Scarborough Guildwood, Mr. Speaker, with Adam Giambroni, where Answer. it wasn't clear at all, it wasn't a real nomination race, Mr. Speaker, and it had to be controlled from the centre. I don't think that's the way it should be done. I think we should be upfront about what's going on, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, on December 20th, according to the police transcript, right. Detective Constable Aaron Thomas asked Mr. Olivier, and I quote, Minister okay, of Municipal and so, Affairs and Housing. Okay, and so from that conversation, were you still unsure as to whether they might appoint Deputy somebody House or whether they were going to go through with the nom open nomination? Unquote. And Andrew Olivier, Olivier said, and I quote, that's what Pat had stated. Is that true, Speaker? 
Mr. Speaker, I will just say again that by the end of November, I had made a decision that Glenn Tebow was going to be our candidate in Sudbury, Mr. Speaker. The conversations that took place were about keeping uh, the past candidate involved. That's, that's why those conversations took place. It's why I had a conversation with, uh, with Andrew Olivier, and I, I suggested some ways he might be involved, Mr. Speaker. But I had made a decision that Glenn Tebow was going to be our candidate. New question, the third party. My next question is for the Premier Speaker. Yesterday, the Premier said that she told Andrew Olivier she would appoint her candidate. But on December 20th, Speaker, Detective Constable Aaron Thomas asked. Stop the clock. What about quiet? <laughs> and I don't appreciate uh, somebody counselling to make more noise. Please continue. On December 20th, Detective Constable Aaron Thomas asked Mr. Olivier, Speaker, he asked him, so, she asked him, so, after you'd spoken with Pat Cerbera on the phone at that time, did you know whether or not there would be an open nomination, whether there would be other people participating in it? And Andrew Olivier said no. If the Premier claims she was so clear, why does, did Andrew Olivier at that time think that no decision had yet been made, Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I had a conversation with Andrew Olivier before the conversation that he had with Pat Cervera. I made it clear to him that I had decided that Glenn Tebow was going to be the candidate, Mr. Speaker. And the fact is that the conversations that took place after that were about keeping the young man involved in the party, Mr. Speaker. That is exactly what happened. And I had made the decision that Glenn Tebow was going to be our candidate by the end of November, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Here, the Premier claims that she decided to appoint Glenn Tebow in November, and she didn't alert the media, and she didn't tell me or the interim leader of the PCs. I get that, Speaker. I get that 100 per cent. But she apparently didn't tell her campaign director uh, slash deputy chief of staff. She didn't tell her liberal kingmaker in the local community, and she didn't tell Andrew Olivier. All the evidence, Speaker, all the tapes, they all show that the Premier's office was offering Andrew Olivier a job so that the Premier's candidate could have his nomination uncontested. The Premier says that never happened. All the evidence says the Premier's version is not true. Is the Premier's story a little bit hard to believe, Speaker? I think so. Does the Premier have any evidence whatsoever to back up her story? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party is exactly right. When I went, when I made the decision. <laughs> When I made the decision after meeting with Glenn Tebow in my home that he was the best person for the candidate, much as I have a deep respect for the media, I didn't go to the media that day, Mr. Speaker, because there was a process that needed to unfold, Mr. Speaker. Glenn Tebow was, uh, he was actually he was changing the party that he was going to be affiliated with, Mr. Speaker, and that was a difficult decision for him to make. And he needed to work with his family and make sure that all of those uh, all yeah. of those pieces were in place so yeah. i had made the decision by the end of november <laughs> mr speaker on. there were conversations to try to keep a young man who obviously would be going through a difficult transition it's a difficult yeah. thing when the leader decides that a different person is going to be the candidate Answer. than the past candidate that was a difficult thing we wanted to keep him involved that's why those conversations yeah. took place final supplementary well, Speaker, the reality remains that there's a mountain of evidence showing that Andrew Olivier was offered a job so the Premier wouldn't have to appoint her hand-picked candidate. There are police interviews and call recordings that any member of the public can hear, Speaker. So my question remains, does the Premier have any evidence at all to back up her story? Thank you. Is that the <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite and a number of the members have asked this same question in 16, 20, 25 different ways, but I'm going to answer it in exactly the same way, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The fact is, I made a decision by the end of November that Glenn Tebow was the best candidate for us in the Sudbury by election. The conversations that took place after that, Mr. Speaker, were about 
keeping the uh, the past candidate involved. That's the reality, Mr. Speaker. That's what those conversations were about. And we have in Glen Tebow a strong voice for Sudbury. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that I was right in that assessment. That Glen Tebow is the best. He is the best representative that Sudbury could have at this moment. We are very happy to have him in our caucus. And we know that he's going to be working very hard for the people of Sudbury. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds Grenville. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the uh, Premier. When the uh, Lieutenant Governor read the speech from the throne, he told us that uh, your government will put evidence before ideology and choose partnership over partisanship. Premier, your government is doing neither. As the evidence mounts against you, your Deputy Chief of Staff and your Liberal operative, you have resorted to ideolog ideological and partisan attacks. Premier, last Friday I launched an online petition that called for you to demonstrate integrity. It requests that you demand the resignation of Pat Sorbera and Jerry Lawhey Jr. until the allegations are resolved. Premier, when will you demonstrate the integrity that's expected from the Office of Premier? Uh, speaker, as I said yesterday, um, I know the Premier very well. I have seen her wrestle with difficult decisions, Speaker. Member I from think Stormont, she, come to order. It's not just my opinion, but it's the opinion of every person who has ever worked with our Premier that integrity is the number one characteristic she has. who makes thoughtful, principle-driven decisions. She wrestles with issues. She thinks hard about what is the right way to go forward. The members opposite have given her lots of advice on what to do. The judgment of the Premier, Answer. what she feels is right in her heart, is something that I have enormous respect for. This is a woman we are blessed to have leading our progress. My question is back to the Premier, Speaker. Premier, you said you do politics differently. Your throne speech said that you would be open and transparent. Deputy House Leader, second time. That doesn't mean you'll have open and transparent nominations. The same throne speech said, and I quote, decisions will be made responsibly, openly, and in the best interests of Ontarians. I don't believe it was responsible and open to have Pat Sorbera offer Andrew Olivier jobs or appointments to step aside. Premier, do you believe it was in the best interest of Ontarians to have your deputy chief of staff allegedly bribe a candidate? You know, Speaker, I, I, I really think that these questions have been asked and asked and asked, and they've been answered consistently and thoughtfully. Not getting the answers they want, Speaker, but they're getting the right answers. So my question really is, we've been back six days. We've had 72 questions. That was at the BA question period. I think we're up to 78 questions. The only questions you're asking, with the remarkable exception of the, of the uh, left and Ken Middlesex members, uh, Speaker, these are the only questions you're asking. Why are you asking about transit? Why are you asking about our economy? Why are you asking about jobs? Why are you asking about health care? Why are you asking about kids with disabilities? Why are you focusing on something that you know actually is under investigation, Speaker? The, speech, the Premier has spoken. It's time you ask real questions. Question. The member from Timmins, James Bay. The question is coming uh, to the Premier, Speaker. The Premier doesn't seem to be taking bribery allegations very seriously. So let's look at what the people outside the legislature are saying. And I'm going to quote from the Toronto Star. Premier Kathleen Wynne and her Liberal Party are digging themselves deeper into a political mess. Ontario will be rightly shocked by allegations from Elections Ontario that two party operatives, including her deputy chief of staff, appear to have broken the law. Under these circumstances, both should step aside while the police investigation is ongoing. That's what the Toronto Star had to say. Is the Premier prepared? to fire Gary Lougheed and Pat Sabera. 
Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier. Uh, speaker, as I said earlier, the, uh, the Premier listens to advice and then she has a conversation with her soul oh, and lands perfect. on the right way forward, the principled way forward. I think it's a bit of a, a ironic speaker or a, a puzzling, maybe I should say, that, that the members opposite are pretending that uh, this is the, that uh, they don't look after uh, their past candidates. They don't try to keep their past candidates involved. I think it's a pretty well-established tradition that, uh, that uh, people uh, actually um, might engage. Stop. Stop. The uh, member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, please come to order. And also the Minister of the Environment. Let's carry on. So there are many examples of this. Let's go back to 1998 when veteran MPP Floyd Logren, I'm quoting now from the Hamilton Spectator, veteran Answer. MPP Floyd Logren, the former Democrat finance minister, is calling it quits to accept a $120,000 a year government appointment. Now, who was energy Thank minister you. at that time? None other than the interim leader of Thank you. Supplementary. Wow. Well, Mr. Speaker, a court would never take with what is in person's soul as evidence in any court case, but nonetheless, it's not just the Toronto Star. The Toronto Sun's editorial has had this to say. Saber is now the subject of two active, ongoing investigations into the... Stop the clock. Order, please. No extra comments. Please finish. Sabera is now the subject of two active, ongoing investigations into the Sudbury by-elections. How can she possibly continue as Wynne's Deputy Chief of Staff and Campaign Director, is said by the Toronto Sun editorial. Is the Premier going to start listening to the voices outside this legislature and take responsibility as Premier and do the right thing and ask Pat Sabera and Mr. Lougheed to step aside? Thank you. Speaker, I have a feeling that, that we just saw history being made because I don't think the NDP has ever before quoted the Toronto Sun editorial. So now, if they're taking advice from the Toronto Sun, it's a new day in Ontario, Speaker. So, you know, I think it's important to go back to why would the Premier, why would the Premier have chosen Glenn Tebow to be the Liberal Party candidate in the election? Who is this man, Glenn Tebow? And I think, you know, I'm sure the member from Nickel Belt knows quite well that he is a man of enormous integrity, Speaker. He is a man who has dedicated his life to improving the lives of the most vulnerable people in Sudbury. Whether it's more his work at the United Way, whether it's his work with Big Sisters, uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, whether it's his coaching team, Speaker, he's engaged in helping improve the lives of people with developmental disabilities, kids with autism. He is a very fine man. And why wouldn't the Thank you. New question. The member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister responsible for Senior Affairs, and it's about government program. Minister, Senior plays an active and important role in our province, community, and economy. In my own riding of Trinity Spadina, we have a considerable active senior population who continue to impact the community in many positive ways. As we know, Mr. Speaker, there are also various challenges and opportunities associated with growing older and seniors have a number of distinct needs our province is working to address. They do. January marks the two-year anniversary of Ontario's action plan for seniors. Recently, the minister visited my riding of Trinity Spadina and celebrated this anniversary and provided important update on the action plan. Mr. Speaker, this plan is more than a framework. It's a promise to our seniors Question. And, our, and their families. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please elaborate on the Ontario's action plan for seniors and inform the House uh, of the initiatives our government is taking to improve this? Thank you. Minister responsible for seniors affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Indeed, uh, the, uh, the minister from Trinity Spadina has a good question, as he is a very not only supportive but very dedicated and committed advocate for seniors in his riding and throughout our province. He is quite right, Speaker. We are we are having 
a very uh, strong uh, shift in our demographic. Uh, Ontarians are living longer, and we're getting more uh, seniors uh, more than ever before, Speaker. We have a huge shift indeed in our demographic. Presently, we have some over 2 million people over the age of 65. We're going to have 4.2 million in about 20 years. Speaker, by 2016-17, we are going to have more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 14. Uh, facing the challenges, myself as Minister and then the Government Speaker, we said we have to face the challenge. So we have in place the Ontario Action Plan for Seniors. The latest one, which the, me the member has mentioned, the Seniors Community Grant Program, Speaker. The first year of operation, we reached out to 179 projects. Thank you. Uh, to some 40 thank you. Supplementary. Okay. I would like to thank the Minister for the response, and it's clear that our government is committed to achieving higher quality of life for our seniors. And I am delighted to say that these specific programs have resonated very well in my riding. In my riding, a remarkable project at the Harborfront Community Centre titled the Urban Granny's Garden Project received $10,000 from the funding of uh, the Senior Community Grant Program. Mr. Speaker, this gardening program fostered a sense of belonging and acceptance among seniors in Trinity Spadina, enabled them to partner up with youth while addressing food safety and community collaboration. The youth are delighted to have learned and developed these new skills, and these seniors are more socially engaged. Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to have the minister to join me in my writing to see firsthand how, how the, uh, the great work the senior group has been, is, is doing in the writing Question. and how the funding is putting good use. Mr. Speaker, can the minister provide us with additional information on the initiatives our government has created to help improve the lives of seniors in this province? Minister. Good question. Good question. Uh, speaker, the member from uh, Trinity Spadan indeed came up with a good question. And we all know that because of the challenge that we are facing with this increasing number of seniors, we had to come up quickly with the Ontario uh, Seniors Plan, uh, which is the uh, very comprehensive uh, plan incorporating the age friendly community planning program, the community transportation pilot grant program, the community paramedicine program. We have the uh, uh, Ontario Elderly Person Centre Speaker. Last week we made some changes by increasing the number of languages to the Finding Your Way program. We now provide information in uh, Urdu, Arabic, Tagalog wow. and Tamil. Wow. This Wonderful. is from the top speaker of another 14, 16 languages actually to the guidance program Incredible. for service to seniors. And sir, speaker, this is why we want to do more for our seniors. We want to make sure that our people, our seniors, are proud to live in Ontario, to grow in Ontario, and age in the province Thank of you. Ontario. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. question the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Uh, yes, Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, we all, well, many of us here, know the rules. You don't comment directly on the outcome of an ongoing investigation. And yet Friday, while impugning and maligning members of this legislature, the Premier couldn't help herself from noting, with regard to the eventuality of the charges for your Deputy Chief of Staff, Pat Silvera, that, quote, on our review of the matter, we don't expect that to happen. Premier, thankfully for the people of Ontario, it is not your expectations we are relying on to determine guilt or innocence. Premier, were your comments just completely inappropriate? Or were they, in fact, attempting to influence the outcome of an ongoing investigation? Mr. Speaker, my comments on Friday were, uh, they were an expression of my belief that, uh, that we were dealing with allegations, that there was an investigation ongoing, Mr. Speaker, and based on, based on what I know about the situation, uh, I had, I'm not asking my, uh, my staff members to step down. That's what I was saying on Friday, Mr. Speaker, and I was, being, I was being very clear about the fact that we had made a decision about who the candidate was going to be in Sudbury and that there had been no offer of anything uh, in return for an action, Mr. Speaker, and that the conversations that had taken place were about trying to keep a young man who had been a candidate involved in the party. That's what the statement on Friday was about, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Premier, your orchestrated strategy to change the channel is straight from the old Liberal handbook, how to stop at nothing to hold power. That's why, despite your assurance that you wouldn't drag individuals through the mud, you did exactly that with a drive-by blanket smear maligning our entire caucus. 
It's also why the member from London North doubled down on your investigation speculation, indicating the allegations are baseless. Premier, an investigation is ongoing. It's not up to you or your deputy to predetermine the outcome. Premier, you told us you'd be different. Yet you're walking in the same scandal-ridden trail of deceit and diversion that Mr. McGinty followed him right out these doors. Is this what we can expect from a win Liberal government, keeping you and your friends in Question. power by buying off seats at any cost? <laughs> we I, um, I stop the clock, please. I listening carefully to all of the questions and answers, and I'm not happy with that last part, but I'm not going to ask you to withdraw other than to just indicate to you it will not be tolerated any further. Here we go. You know there's an investigation going on. We are not playing Perry Mason on this side of the House, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The, the 78 questions that have come, if the uh, Deputy <laughs> Premier's calculation is right, uh, the questions that have come from the other side are doing just that, right, that yeah. Mr. Well, Speaker. Uh, I was making a point on Friday when I said that I stated the fact that there have been members from other parties who have come across to us and have talked to uh, members in this caucus about the fact that they would be willing to uh, step down from their seat in return for an appointment. That, Mr. Speaker, is a fact. That has happened. I didn't name names because it wasn't about individuals. It was about the reality that we said no, Mr. Speaker. We said no, we're not going to do that, even though those, uh, those approaches had been made. That's the point I was making. I made that point on Friday. The member opposite has brought it up in a context that makes me re repeat what I, uh, what I said, but I was saying it to make a point about the fact that we said no, we were not going to do that. No question. The member from Bramley, Thank you very much, Mr. Oh, Speaker. Yeah. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's not just the Toronto Star, it's not just the Toronto Sun. The Ottawa Citizen Editorial Board wrote this Using public appointments to reward loyal service is one thing, dangling the possibility of appointments while trying to persuade someone to give up their candidacy is quite another. And a column in the Global Mail said, quote, as it turns out, Ms. Wynne is not quite as different from Mr. McGinty as she appeared." End quote. These quotes are not from question period. Will the Premier start listening? Um, let's, again, let's just be clear. Um, I had made a decision by the end of November that Glenn Tebow was the best person to be our candidate. Yep. There was no candidacy. There was no position that the past candidate held, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we were working to try to keep this young man involved. He had been our candidate. He was not going to be our candidate again, and we were working to try to keep him involved. He didn't have any position other than past candidate. So when I say that there was nothing offered in, uh, in uh, exchange for an action, Mr. Speaker, that's exactly the case because he wasn't in a position. He was a past candidate, and I had made a decision that Glenn Tebow was going to be our candidate, not Andrew Olivier. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's not just the Star, it's not just the Sun, the Citizen, Globe and Mail. There's also the National Post. And I quote, one of the incongruities of elected politics is a cynical assumption that laws are made to be observed by others. Ms. Wynn reflected this attitude in spades Friday. And here's the Waterloo record, and here's what they had to say. Quote, Ontario's governing Liberals make the law, but they are not above it. Premier Kathleen Wynne seems blind to this fact. End quote. The Premier is not just hearing from the opposition. She's hearing from the Toronto Star, the Toronto Sun, the Ottawa Citizen, Globe and Mail, the National Post, and the Waterloo record. Everyone but the Premier knows the Liberals are on the wrong side of this issue. Will the Premier finally do the right thing and admit some responsibility Question. and fire Pat Sabera and Jerry Lahey? Well, Speaker, again, I have to say it's getting a bit boring in here, I think. Uh, there are important questions facing this province, Speaker, important questions, and you're not asking them. You know, it's it's very clear that the premier made a decision to uh, that that Glenn Tebow would be our candidate. It's very clear that uh, that our party actually reached out and tried to have a conversation with the past candidate. And if if you actually listen to the tape, if you actually listen to the tape, you would it's abundantly clear 
that Andrew Olivier knew that he was not going to be the, the candidate from the very beginning of the conversation with Pat Sobera. So, you know, Jerry Kaplan, who's a good New Democrat, good New Democrat, said, uh, why, why we're making this the biggest deal in the world is beyond me. Well, I tell you, Speaker, it's beyond me when there are important issues facing the people of Ontario. Why both opposition parties continue to focus on this is beyond me, too. Thank you. Your question, the member from Barrie. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Ministry of Com Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister, your min ministry is pursuing a mandate of transformation for the services it offers people living with disabilities. This government has clearly chosen to make individuals with developmentally developmental disabilities priority by making the significant investment of $810 million over three years in the developmental services sector. Right. Minister, you have said before that this government is working towards having people with disabilities fully included in the fabric of our communities and to be able to live as independently as possible, like Taylor Abbaspor of Barrie, who now has two jobs and is preparing to move into his own apartment. Minister, can you please tell the House how Question. your ministry is working towards this goal? Thank you. Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Barry for the question. As the member said, our government is choosing to invest in Ontario's most vulnerable people, yeah, and yeah, thousands yeah. of people are already yeah, yeah. benefiting from the budget investment. Last fall, I shared with this House my ministry's launch of the Developmental Services Employment and Modernization Fund. This fund is set to deliver $15 million over three years. Years and is part of the $810 million investment strategy. This fund is intended to support the ongoing transformation of the developmental services system into one that is more person-directed, collaborative and efficient, and promotes greater inclusion and independence for individuals. In this first round of funding, round of funding that was announced earlier this month, the government is supporting 38 projects around Ontario that were selected as best meeting the Answer. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. I can't hear the question, Mr. Speaker. Say supplementary. Thank you, Minister. This new Employment and Modernization Fund is a strong example of the way that this government is using innovative leaders in the developmental services sector to make tangible difference for people with developmental disabilities and their families. In my riding of Barrie, Simcoe Community Services is one of the 38 successful proposals of this new fund. This agency, supported by this government, has been doing great work for many years to support individuals in their daily life and seek better integration in their communities and economy. Now, with this additional project funding, CEO Marion Graves says this agency will be able to expand their pool of prospective employers. That's Minister, great. can you please elaborate on what other ways this fund will improve the lives of people across Ontario? Thank you. Minister. We're moving the developmental services sector to, to a place that better integrates individuals in their community and economy and transforms the way supports are offered to them. First, it is clear that those with developmental disabilities are a very diverse group of individuals with varying interests and abilities, so that customizing employment initiatives is very important to ensure a successful outcome. This means that agencies need to collaborate more closely to help transition individuals to employment opportunities in the community. An excellent example of this type of initiative is Live Work Play in Ottawa that I visited along with Minister Nakwi last Friday. We want to make municipal community programs more inclusive and develop a provincial centre of excellence on employment. We are transforming the developmental Answer. services sector wow. so that individuals That's are now living in the community and That's have every opportunity to work in their I mean, community. New question, the member from Leeds Granville. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. My question is uh, to the Premier. Premier, yesterday, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services said that your government would not interfere with the removal of Jerry Lahey Jr. from the Greater Sudbury Police Services Board. The minister said, and I quote, under Regulation 42197, the members of the Police Services Board Code of Conduct, that it is up to the Ontario Civilian Police Commission to consider whether or not the Code of Conduct is being complied with or not. That's true. 
But are you aware that Section 25, Subsection 1 of the Police Services Act allows your minister to request the Ontario Civilian Police Commission to investigate, inquire into and report on the conduct of a member of the board? Premier, through your minister, will you request that independent body investigate the inappropriate actions Question. of Jerry Lawhey Jr.? Thank you. Thank you. Attorney General. Attorney General. Merci, Monsieur, uh, Monsieur Speaker. First of all, I didn't have the, uh, the chance to congratulate our uh, member, Glenn Thibault, for a wonderful uh, election in Sudbury, so I'm very pleased to he ran a positive campaign, and uh, the people of Sudbury have spoken, and they have elected him. So, on the question, Mr. Speaker, all police service board members appointed by the province or municipal council are subject to the code, uh, code of conduct under the Police Service Act. And uh, I understand that the uh, Sudbury Police Service Board uh, addressed this issue recently, and they have voted for Mr. Lahi to retain his position. So if it is an, uh, important to know that if a board member Answer. has breached the code of conduct, an investigation by the Ontario Civil Police Commission may be conducted pursuant to Section 25 Thank you. of the PSA. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Well, back, uh, back to the Premier. The Police Services Board Code of Conduct, Section 14, Subsection 1, states a board member whose conduct or performance is being investigated or inquired into by the Commission under Section 25 of the Act shall decline to exercise his or her duties as a member of the board for the duration of the investigation. This is not an issue of uh, a political interference by the board. We have an open investigation by the OPP and a damning report by the chief electoral officer. It's time for you to request an independent investigation from the Ontario Civilian Police Commission, thus requiring Mr. Lougheed to step away from the board. I'm asking you, Premier and Minister, will you ask for that investigation Question. to take place? Be seated. Thank you. Attorney General. Again, Mr. Speaker, the Police Service Act does not give do the minister the authority to remove a board member. So it is important to note that uh, if a board Order. member has breached the code of conduct, an investigation by the Ontario Civil Police Commission may be conducted pursuant to Section 25 of the Public uh, uh, Serv Service Act. So uh, the uh, the OCP would decide if a hearing into the matter is warranted. So that's the process. So you, anybody can uh, report a case to the Ontario Civil, Civilian Police Commission. And so if the member wants to do it, it's up to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est très simple et elle est à la Première Ministre. Qui a dit à Monsieur Lahit? My question is simple. Who told Mr. Lockheed and Ms. Sobara to offer employment to Mr. Olivier? About this question, once again, I will say I had a conversation with Andrew Olivier in order for him to remain involved in the party. I decided that Glenn Thibault, who was the best candidate for our, part, uh, our party in Sudbury, and I am very happy to have Mr. Thibault in, in my party, in our government. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Monsieur le Président, c'est pas par coïncidence que Monsieur Lockheed et Madame Sobara. Mr. Chair, it is not a coincidence that uh, Ms. Sobara and Jerry Lockheed were calling Andrew Olivier and in the name of the Premier. They told him he could have anything he wanted as long as he was not a candidate for the Liberal Party. And it is not a coincidence that the three people thought that um, nominating a candidate had not been done yet. So who took the decision to tell uh, Lockheed and Sobar to do what they did? Mr. Chair, I decided that Glenn Thibault was the best candidate for this election, the by-election in Sudbury. I took this decision.
I had a conversation with Andrew Olivier so that he would remain involved in our party because I believe that it is the responsibility of a party leader. And uh, I made the decision. We were working to engage Andrew Olivier. Those, that's what the conversations between Pat Cerbera and Andrew Olivier were about, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Davenport. Oui, miss, uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, Ontario's biodiversity and natural heritage contributes substantial ecological and economic benefits to our province. Yet, invasive species threaten our province's biodiversity and can have drastic impacts on our economy. Our one species that is already established in Ontario, the zebra mussel, clogged the intake pipes of municipal water supplies and hydroelectric companies and interfere with the overall enjoyment of our lakes and rivers. Managing zebra mussels costs between $75 and $91 million each year. Another invasive species, the emerald, emerald ash borer, is a beetle that has devastating impacts on Ontario's ash trees. Since 2002, the emerald ash borer has spread across much of southwestern Ontario, Sault Ste. Marie, and the Ottawa area. This beetle kills approximately 99% of ash trees as it moves through the area, and I understand that over 118 hectares have already been affected. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could he explain how, uh, what our government is Thank doing you. to stop the spread of these species in Ontario? The, uh, minister of Resources and Forestry. Speaker, thank you, and I want to thank the uh, the member from Davenport for uh, for the question. Speaker, it's important that in Ontario we be as proactive as we possibly can. In the past, we've been reactive. And the member through her question has referenced a couple of examples, the zebra mussel costing us $90 million a year uh, in terms of trying to deal with it once it's arrived. We know by being proactive, we can limit that. The emerald ash borer is another great example. Here in the City of Toronto, spending $37 million over the last five years and removing a significant portion of their urban forest canopy. We need to try and be more proactive where we can be on these issues. Speaker, there are examples where we've been successful, too. Since the ballast water restrictions and changes have come into play, we don't believe there's been an introduction of another aquatic invasive species into the Great Lakes since 2006, since those uh, changes came into place. And in regard to the emerald ash borer, simply by heating, preheating pallets, and they believe the borer, the emerald ash borer, came in on wooden pallets, Answer. simply by preheating those pallets before they come over, you can deal with it that way. That's one of the reasons we've reintroduced the Invasive Species Act. We want to be proactive on this file and carry this Thank you. forward. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry for his response and leadership on this important issue. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to hear that our government is taking a proactive role in preventing, detecting, and rapidly responding to invasive species. However, often environmentalists, landowners, industry and hunters, and anglers of this province have competing interests when it comes to addressing environmental concerns in Ontario. And municipalities are very interested in preventing the spread of invasive species as they are often at the front lines, paying the cost when these species invade our communities. Though I know you have worked with a number of stakeholders to bring this legislation forward, my constituents are concerned about the impact this legislation will have on everyday Ontarians and industry. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, could he please explain to the House what our government is doing to work with stakeholders, Question. communities and municipalities to prevent invasive species from affecting our environmental and, our environment and economy? Thank you, Minister. Well, Speaker, thank you. And once again, I want to thank the, uh, the member from, da from Davenport for the question. Speaker, last week or, or the week before, I was in Ottawa uh, for a conference primarily centered on dealing with biodiversity in Canada, uh, Canada-wide. It was a federal, provincial, territorial minister's meeting dealing with biodiversity, but a significant part of the conference dealt with the issue related to invasive species. Ontario was seen as a leader on this file. And one of the requests that Ontario brought to the conference was that we establish a federal provincial task force on a move forward basis, on a go forward basis, to deal with this in a pan Canadian approach. Uh, Minister Aglikak was there. She was the host and the leader on the conference. Through her uh, leadership, as well as with the support of the other federal, provincial, and territorial ministers, we received agreement. We have now established and will establish in very short order a task force dealing specifically with invasive species. This will be to the benefit of all of us across Canada, of course, invasive species know no boundaries. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Your the member from York Simcoe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Premier, here's a quote. 
and I begin. It is of the utmost importance that we lead responsibly, act with integrity, manage spending wisely, and are accountable for every action we take. Can you tell me whose words those are? Mr. Speaker, I imagine I said that. <laughs> I'm, I'm just thinking that I, I said that, and certainly if it's not a quote from me, it's certainly something that I believe, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, it's why on Friday, if we're, if we're still talking about the Sudbury by-election, which I imagine we are, it's why on Friday, Mr. Speaker, I made a clear statement about when I had made the decision, what we were going to do in terms of the ongoing investigation. We were going to cooperate with the authorities, and uh, I made it clear, Mr. Speaker, what my actions going forward would be. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Yes, uh, Premier, the quote is yours. In fact, the quote is, uh, believe, it is found in every mandate letter you wrote to your cabinet ministers. Unfortunately, it seems that the value you place on integrity is dependent on circumstances and is flexible when it suits your needs. During your latest scandal, did it not occur to you that you are asking Jerry Lawhey to break a police services board code of conduct regulation, which states that board members shall refrain from engaging in conduct that would discredit or compromise the integrity of the board or the police force. Why did you put Mr. Lawheed in a position where he would be breaking his code? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, okay. this question has been asked many times in many different ways. I've answered the question. I've made it clear that the conversations that took place were in the context of my having decided who the best candidate was going to be for us, and that was Glenn Tebow, and we were trying to work to keep the past candidate involved. That's what the context was, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Thank you. Your question is from uh, a former man too. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est à la Première Ministre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. After asking Monsieur Andrew Oliver, Olivier to step aside so that the Premier could nominate her favorite candidate, Ms. Cerbera said to Mr. Olivier that he was the third person who had been asked to step aside. So who are these two other persons and what are the offers that were made to them? I would like to say once again that I made a decision when I decided that I made the decision that Glenn Thibault would be the best candidate for the riding of Sudbury. And we had conversations to continue to engage our former candidate in the party or about suggestions about ways that he could uh, stay involved in uh, the party <laughs> apart from being a candidate because he was not going to be the candidate Glenn Tebow was going to be our candidate Mr. Speaker once again to the premier Ms. Patsarbara said to Mr. Olivier that it was the third time that the Premier contacted people to ask them to withdraw their candidacy. So who are these other people who got those calls? I said that I had made a decision. I do not know who are these other people. I know that Pat Cerbera had a conversation with Andrew Olivier to engage Andrew in the party going forward because he used to be our candidate. These are the facts, Speaker. Oh, thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Energy, who we were able to host in uh, my riding of Cambridge in November, uh, talking about energy and the new master servicing agreement that uh, was signed between Bruce Power and uh, Babcock and Wilcox. So thank you for coming then. Minister, it seems that Ontario's electricity system has changed significantly since the independent electricity system operator, IESO, and the former Ontario Power Authority were created in 1999 and 2004, respectively. In fact, I believe that the areas of overlap and duplication between the two agencies have been noted since a report from the agency review panel. I understand that the IESO and the former OPA have now merged to form a single entity, 
as of the beginning of this year in 2015. Speaker, through you to the minister, could the minister Mr. please advise the House as to the role and responsibilities of the newly merged independent electricity systems operator? Thank, thank you very you. much. Minister Mr. Question. Speaker, I thank the member from Cambridge for the question. Uh, the newly merged independent electricity system operator is responsible for ensuring there's enough power to meet the province's electricity needs in real time while planning and securing electricity supply for the future. It does this, Mr. Speaker, by balancing the supply and demand of electricity in Ontario and directing its flow across the province's transmission lines, planning for the province's medium and long-term electricity needs, and securing clean sources of supply, overseeing the electricity wholesale market, and fostering the development of a conservation culture. A joint working committee reviewed each organization to determine where efficiencies could be found while ensuring that the electricity system remained safe and reliable. Mr. Speaker, the merger which took effect January 1 first was smooth, seamless, Mr. Speaker, and it is generating very significant efficiencies. Thank you. Good. Supplementary. Very good. Thank you, Minister. I think it's helpful for families and businesses in Ontario to know what the new independent electricity systems operator does and what it's responsible for. I'm sure it was a complex process to merge the IESO and the OPA. I find it reassuring to hear of the Joint Working Committee that worked collaboratively collaboratively to review where the efficiencies were being found to ensure that our electricity system remained safe and reliable for all Ontarios, including those in my riding of Cambridge. I know that you and the Ministry of Energy staff have been focusing on improving the efficiency in the energy sector and have placed a specific focus of improving efficiency at our energy agency. Question. While there are obvious efficiencies, such as the reduction from two boards of directors to one and two CEOs to one, could the minister please advise the House how else the merger of these Thank two you. agencies will increase efficiency? Minister. This is a question, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I thank the, the member for the uh, supplementary question. Well, cares about this. The government's priority is to continue building a clean, reliable, and cost-effective electricity system for Ontarians. So the merger of the Independent Electricity System Operator, the IESO, and the former Ontario Power Authority, OPA, was implemented to increase operational efficiencies and contain costs. And the merger is expected to increase operational efficiency, create synergies, and contain costs, Mr. Speaker, by bringing short, medium, and long-term planning functions together, simplifying the electricity sector, for in industry and consumers and coordinate the flow of electricity between generators and flash. consumers. The merger supports yes, our government's commitment to improve agency efficiency, reduce costs in the electricity sector, and help mitigate costs for rate Thank makers, you. Mr. Speaker. Um, it's uh, very usual that the Speaker announce the uh, visitation of a special guest. Uh, Mr. Alvin Curling in the West Public Gallery. The, uh, so uh, allow me for the record to put down what I normally say. So that is uh, the member uh, in the 33rd, 34th, 35th and 36th parliaments of the riding of Scarborough North and in the 37th and 38th Parliament of the riding of Scarborough Rose River, and in the 38th Parliament, our former Speaker. Thank you very much for being here. I, uh, bef before we do our vote, I have been requested to ask a few more uh, people, so Sorry. point of order from the Premier. Sorry, I, uh, I did not notice that in, uh, in the gallery are three of my constituents, uh, Paul Robert, Margaret Casey, and Janet McDougall. I just wanted to welcome them. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I may have said Public Service Act instead of Police Service Act answering the question for the member from Leeds-Grenville. If I have said that, I would like to correct myself. 
Thank you. Point of order to correct your record is always appropriate. Uh, Minister of Education. Uh, point of order, I'd like to correct my record too. When I referenced the heckling about parents should be able to vote on evolution curriculum, I shouldn't have named the individual. I should have given the riding. I should have said Chad, the member from Chad and Kent Ashes. <laughs> While one is allowed to correct their record, I, uh, I do accept that as a point of order, but uh, not in the spirit, I believe, uh, we are supposed to be intending this. We have a deferred vote uh, on the motion of second reading of Bill 31. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? All members please take their seats. Thank you. On November the 27th, 2014, Mr. Del Duca moved second reading of Bill 31, an act to amend the Highway 407 East Act 2012 and the Highway Traffic Act in respect to various matters and to make a consequential amendment to the Provincial Offenses Act. All those in favour of the motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Nathan, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Bradley, Mr. Shirelli, Mr. Shirelli, Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor, Mr. Susan, Mr. Susan, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Wynn, Ms. Matthews, Ms. Matthews, Mr. Hoskins, Mr. Hoskins, Ms. Sandler, Ms. Sandler, Mr. Duga, Mr. Duga, Mr. Quinter, Mr. Quinter, Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, Mr. Takar, Mr. Takar, Mr. Bardetti, Mr. Bardetti, Mr. Quadri, Mr. Quadri, Mr. Orzetti, Mr. Mr. Orzetti, Mr. Gravel, Mr. Gravel, Mr. McNeekin, Mr. McNeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Mr. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Dahmer. Ms. Dahmer. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Ms. Vernillo. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Ms. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Fagelli. Mr. Fagelli. Mr. Yakubas. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Mr. Clark. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Yeah. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Ms. Marto. Ms. Marto. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Mansell. Mr. Mansell. Mr. Mansell. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Novo. Mr. Novo. Mr. Novo. Madam Jelena. Madam Jelena. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Spice. Ms. Spice. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise. Time and be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 88, the nays are zero. The ayes being 88 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Shall, shall the bill be ordered for third reading? Minister of Transportation? Yes. So ordered? can barely hear what he's saying. The bill has been referred to the uh, Committee for General Government. Thank you very much. Yes. You're welcome, member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. The, uh, in the speaker's gallery are uh, friends of mine from the riding of Brant who are here with lunch with the MPP in their support for charity, Mr. Ken Mercer and Sherry Martin. Welcome and thank you for being here. Not everybody. There are no deferred, no further deferred votes. This house stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon.